Hey everybody, I'm glad you joined us today. My name is Will Simmons. This is my lovely wife, Amber. Hello. I'm glad that you're doing this with me today. It's going to be fun, mm -hmm. huh? All right. We're going to continue our study through Exodus. We're going to be in Exodus chapter 20 today, and that's the Ten Commandments. But let me give you a little background, a little review of where we are. We have just gone through chapter 19. And we are aware that the children of Israel are encamped at the base of Mount Sinai. Now, Mount Sinai was where uh, Moses encountered God 40 years ago. And God told Moses to go to Egypt, tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Mm -hmm. And he said, God said this to Moses in Exodus chapter 3, 11 through 12. I'm going to skip to verse 12. He says, when you brought the people out of Egypt... You will worship God at this very mountain. So here they are. They're back at this mountain. God is going to teach them how to worship him, and they will stay in this location for about a year before they leave. So it's going to be a while. They're going to learn a lot of things at this mountain. And um, last week, chapter 19 was just amazing. Right. Because the Lord descended on a cloud. He told him, he said, in three days, I'm going to talk to you. You need to get everything ready. Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, it was thunder and lightning and just fire. And it was just an awesome thing. And God told Moses, he said, I'm going to speak to you. Behold, I come to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear when I speak with you and believe you forever. So, He's fixing to give Moses the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. And he is going to speak these commandments to Moses, where the Bible says in uh, 19 verse 9, where everybody can hear. And I've always thought and seen on TV and everything, it's almost like God called Moses up to the mountain, hung out with him for 40 days, gave him these commands, and then I always thought that Moses descends down off the mountain with the two tablets and then he reads to the people, hey, this is what God said. Right. So for 40 days, he's up there trying to chisel the rock or whatever. Mm -hmm. And if he makes a mistake, he has a start over. I don't know. That's just what I thought. Right. But this says that God speaks the commandments where everybody can hear. And then later is when he takes Moses up and, uh, and has him chisel them out on the stone. So let's start this way. Let's just start by reading what those commandments are. Okay. And then we'll talk about the importance of the law. And it says in chapter 20, verse 1, And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. And you shall not covet your neighbor's house or your neighbor's wife, his male servant, his female servant, his ox, donkey, or anything that is your neighbor. So, that is, that's the, the Ten Commandments. That's the law. And the law is coming from God to Moses, to all the people. And um, I don't know how you feel about rules mm -hmm. and the law. Right. But when I hear about laws or rules or do's and don'ts, I just feel very restricted. Right. But this is coming from God. And it says God spoke all these words. So I would say that there would have to be something positive coming from from God, right. you know. And I love how he goes from like this epic chapter 19 to into chapter 20. He gets very personal with the Israelites. He starts off in verse 2, I am the Lord your God. He started off by reminding them who he was and the relationship that he had had with them. And then he says, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. So not only did he remind them who he was, he reminded them what he had done for them. And I think that's so fitting in the times that we're going through right now with this, this pandemic that the nation's facing and the fear that may be in our hearts and then the chaos and the unknowns um, to remind ourselves 
of this time, who God is and what he's done for us in the past. Um, one of my favorite things about last week, we talked about in chapter 19, uh, in verse 23, Moses told, um, responded to the Lord and he told them to put a boundary around the mountain and consecrate that boundary. That really stuck out to me last week about consecrating the boundaries in our life. Um, I was able to just take a moment last week and just, just kind of pause and think about the boundaries that God has placed in my life and, and consecrate those. Consecrate means to make it or declare it sacred. You know, there's been times in my life where I've, I've gone through something or I've been in a situation and the Lord clearly put a boundary or a commandment or a law or a voice from the Holy Spirit directed me in a certain way. Um, many times I heeded that, and I'm very thankful for that. There's been times in my life that I didn't heed that, that I kind of bulldozed and went up on that mountain to do whatever I thought was best. But here the Lord is giving commandments to the Israelites, and I think it's important just to pause here before we get into those commandments and think, okay, in the past, when has God guided me through his laws and rules? He's, he's just reminding us that he is there for us and he's got us through things in the past and he's going to guide us through things in the future. So um, I just challenge everybody this week just to take some time and think about those rules, those laws, those commandments that are in place. Um, youth and children, maybe get with your parents and maybe consecrate some of the rules that they've placed in your life. You know, it's very hard as a parent to say no to our kids or take things away. We're not doing it to be mean. Or to, so that they can't have life and have fun, but we're doing that to guide them in the direction we would have them to go. And that, that's what the Lord is doing here with the Ten Commandments. Um, I read a quote this week that says, These commandments don't strip our freedom, but instead provide it. The Ten Commandments aren't instructions on how to get out of Egypt or slavery. They are rules for a free people to stay free. And I think that's important to remember as we go into the Ten Commandments that these aren't rules to limit our freedom, but these are rules that the decisions we make, that we still stay free in those decisions and we don't get in the bondage of slavery. Yeah, and I think the fact that the time that he's given them this, these commandments uh -huh. points to exactly what you're saying because he didn't give them this list of laws or rules while they were in slavery and while they were right. in Egypt and said, if you follow these perfectly, then I will grant you freedom. Then I'll deliver you. Right. He's, he's already defeated their enemies. He's delivered them from slavery. Mm -hmm. He killed their, their enemies in the Red Sea and he protected them. And now he's got them in a place where he says, you're going to worship me here. And then he gives them these commands. And it's like he's saying, look, you don't have to earn my favor. And I don't expect you to earn my favor. Like, I love you. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to be vigilant and watch over you. And it reminds me a lot of, um, man, what we hang our hat on with salvation. Because it, the Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Mm -hmm. So we didn't, we didn't earn salvation. We can't earn salvation. But the Lord says, I love you. This is how I feel about you. And I'm going to deliver you from that. You don't have to earn that freedom. But he says, you're going to come back to me at this mountain and worship me here. So I really think he's teaching them and us through these commands just how to express our gratitude, how to, how to worship him. Right. And that very first command, he says, you shall have no other gods before me and I thought it was interesting to think okay what is what's a God from God's perspective because he's God so but he's saying you'll have no other gods and it's a it's a little g God it's not a capital G there so he's saying you shall have no other gods before me well a God is whatever is esteemed or loved or feared mm -hmm. or served or delighted in or depended on more than God you know and, and that thing whatever it may be if we're if we feel that way towards it then we have in effect made it a God in our life mm -hmm. and we know how God feels about other gods he proved that 
in Egypt to the Egyptians right. because they had a bunch of gods that were on the same level and God for everything and he completely humiliated the gods that they serve they serve to show that he was the one true God and so not only did the Egyptians learn how serious he was about uh, somebody worshiping something over him or depending on something over him or serving on some, serving something other than him these Israelites ought to know that when he says, you shall have no other gods before me, he's serious about that. Right. And that before me was interesting to me. And I looked it up, and it, it actually means that um, to, be, to be in my face. It literally means to my face. And what stood out to me just thinking about it is if you're doing something in front of somebody's face, right in front of their face, they know you're doing it, right. you know? And, but how many times do we pretend that we don't have any other gods before him and we forget that he is an all-knowing God? Mm -hmm. He knows our heart. He knows the intent of our heart. He knows our motives. And sometimes we like to play with God and say, no, this other thing is not beside you or above you. And the whole time he's saying, I know where your allegiance is. Right. So we can't fool him, you know? And he humiliated those other gods to the Egyptians. He humiliated them in the face of the Israelites. But I like that he warned them before he did it. Right. He gave them many chances. Some of them, get your, get your servants out of the field, get your animals out of the field, because this is coming. And some of them heeded that advice and some of them did not. So even though he is very strict and very serious about, I don't want to be just added to your life. I don't want to be beside your other gods. I don't want any other gods behind me. I want to be the one you depend on. I want to be the one you serve. But even though he's very serious about that, he still will give you a warning. He still will let you know, look, if you don't turn to me, then I can do away with this thing that you're serving. Right, hmm. right. and, and then this gets us into commandment two, which is very um, similar to commandment one, but it also stands alone. It says, do not make an idol for yourself, whether in the shape of anything in the heavens above the earth or below it or in the waters under the earth. Do not bow in worship to them and do not serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the father's iniquities to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing faithful love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. You know, Israel here, they were worshiping created gods, not the creator. They were carving them out of wood and stone, or they were melting, making them from melting rock, you know, precious metals. They were putting a lot of work and effort and time and talent into creating these, these idols. And I think God has given us a warning here. You know, it's easy to say and to look in the Bible and say, we can't relate to that. Why were they doing that? Why were they whittling gods out of stone and that's silly but don't we do the same thing mm -hmm. don't we take our time our efforts our talents resources god's given us and put it into creating something and god's saying be careful because later you will have to bow to that creation that thing that you're putting all your your energy into is going to consume you um tim keller has a quote that i I keep in my phone that I love this and it's kind of a gut check for if an idol's in your life. He says, you know you have an idol when they consume you when you pursue them, disappoint you when you get them, and devastate you when you lose them. I think one of the things that this, what we're going through right now, one of the things that that shed light on is the idols in our life. Maybe it's put a spotlight on some of those idols. You know, is it an idol? It's, an idol is something that consumes you when you pursue it. I mean, a lot of us spend all of our time, energy, talent in pursuing jobs. Only this week to find out our job's not as secure as we think it is. Or a number on the scale for, for us women. Or the perfect vehicle or our kids' sports or activities. You know, what consumes you? What's the first thing that you think about in the morning and the last thing that you think about at night? And has your, has your mind and attention throughout the day? It's probably an idol in your life. 
um, idols can disappoint you when you get them. I think we've all hmm. we've all been there. We've all strived to get that something, whatever it is, or achieve that number, whether it be big or small. Um, and we get there and we think, you know, this didn't solve all my problems. This wasn't what I thought it would be. And idols devastate you when you lose them. You know, there's things that we can think about in our life that we just could not do without. It could be a person. It could be, like we said, a career. I mean, it can be anything. And we think if, if that was taken away from me, I would not be able to function. So that's just kind of a, a gut check for if something is an idol in your life. But again, the Lord is warning us here. He's saying, don't have any other gods before me. And also, don't put your time, your talents, your energy into creating something that later will become your God. Right. And he, and he says also in there, he says, he gives us a new name for himself. He said, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Right. And I think if, if I, I just, I like that he says that about himself. Also with the connotations that we have with jealousy into this commandment that says don't go and make some kind of image to worship and serve. Right. It's almost if we're trying it's almost like we're thinking, well is God jealous of what I may build? Right. Man, he's not he says the whole earth is mine. He said that in chapter nineteen. Right. You hear in other places in the Bible, he says, I own a thousand cattle on a thousand hills. I mean, he created the heavens and the earth. Like, he owns it all. There's nothing we could make that he would be jealous of because if we make anything, it's he's provided it anyway. Right. So he's not saying, oh, please don't make something because I'll want it. He's not jealous of us. He's jealous for us. Mm -hmm. And so I think what he's saying is in light of these these first two um, commandments, he's saying, look, I have so much for you. I am jealous for the things that I have for you. But if you put other stuff in front of me, if you put your time, talent, energy, money, et cetera, et cetera, into building something that you're going to bow to, then you're going to miss out on this awesome plan, right. this awesome promise that I have for you. Right. And so he's not jealous of us. That's ridiculous. He's jealous for us. And really a better English translation for that word for jealous would be zealous, right. meaning he's extremely passionate yeah. for us. Also, Deuteronomy 4, 23, 24, we see the title of a jealous God again. He says, for the Lord your God is a jealous God, um, a consuming fire. That's ultimately destroying anything opposed to his holiness. So he's telling us these things that we put our effort into, they're not eternal. Mm. They're going to be exposed by fire, mm. um, you know, as the, as the idols that they created were in that day as well. Um, true worship will always cause us to destroy the idols in our life. Look, I know that I'm naive, but I really, really believe in Matthew 6.33. And I think the verses before it and after it are fitting for what we're going through now as well. It says, um, for the Gentiles eagerly seek these things. And, and you can fill in the blank in anything. They were, what shall we wear? What shall we drink? What shall we, we do? But it says, the Gentiles eagerly seek these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. And you can fill in the blank with what, what's there for you. But all these things will be provided to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And my prayer for us this week that we just kind of pause and just take in these commandments and think everything that God has for us. And, and yes, each day has its troubles of its own. But I think if we seek first the kingdom of God, we put him, we put no other gods before him, beside him, even close to him. We don't, we don't spend our time, our energy into making idols. Everything that, that we think that we may want, God's going to provide it for us, right? Yeah. And, and that's kind of, so that's the challenge for this week. We're going to have some, uh, some questions that go along with, kind of almost broken down into each section about the law. We're going to have questions that, that are surrounded surrounding this first commandment and questions that are surrounding this second commandment and a challenge. 
so that you individually or as a family you can dig deeper and and just think about what is the bible saying and what is the lord trying to teach us through these ten commandments but i believe he's he's teaching us look i'm the only god that you need to be pursuing you need to seek me first so here's the challenge this week i want you to ask god to just reveal any idols that you may be building and carving and depending on any any idol that you may be putting before him beside him behind him and just allow him to reveal that to you so we just want to say a prayer for you lord thank you so much for how good you are to us lord i thank you for your word and how it just reveals your heart how you uh, feel about us and Lord, I know you've got great promises for each and every one of us. Lord, I pray that we will, uh, this week, have the courage to ask you to examine our heart and to reveal to us if we put any gods before you or if we're currently trying to carve or build anything that we're eventually going to have to bow down to. Lord, I know we can trust you. I know that we can uh, be vulnerable in front of you. So Lord, just take care of each and every one of us. And, um, and remind us and show us and prove to us how deeply you care. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. We miss you guys. We love you and we will see you guys soon. Bye-bye.